Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of How to Get Away with Staffing. Uh, my name is Colin, and I'm the president of Fox Hire. And I've got a couple people from my team here uh, to continue our series on how to build a back office. So Jessica Arby, our director of HR, and Nate Kappel, uh, product manager, we are going to talk about uh, building a back office in relation to onboarding. And onboarding in staffing can be unique. So I think that might be just the first question. Jess, why why is onboarding and staffing unique? Um, so in, in the staffing industry, we see all sorts of different roles that we're putting in our EOR, you know, under our EOR umbrella. <clears throat> so, um, you know, we might have engineers, people in light industrial, we've got people in the healthcare industry. So we've got a lot of different industries and job types that we're accommodating. Um, so that, you know, also includes different types of onboarding that might be included for them. So, um, you know, when you're working in one specific industry, you can kind of set it and forget it almost, you know, if you're, you know, just not, um, you know, just paying attention to what new things come up in the law and things like that. But with us, you know, in staffing, there's something different nearly every day in every contract that we get, um, you know, especially like, uh, client specific requ requirements or, you know, industry specific, like say healthcare needing um, drug screens and, you know, things like that. So it's just, it's always going to be different in staffing. Yeah. No, I think hundred percent, there's a ton of variety and there are a lot of recruiting and staffing firms that do multiple industries. So if you are doing multiple industries, you've got to be up to date on all the requirements in each of those industries. Um, but also I think there's uniqueness in that every client you work with may have a different onboarding process right. or specific documents that they want filled out, right? So a traditional employer, they have their process, they have their one or two or three custom documents that are outside of the bare minimum that they require. And then from there, that's it, right? Whereas if you're in a staffing industry, you've got to cater to multiple clients. And that client relationship also creates this idea of like a supply chain. So onboarding and staffing is unique specifically around client relationships in that you are delivering a product to them and that product is a person. And if you can't get them onboarded, then you can't deliver. So it's similar to a supply chain in that um, you have to do some logistics there to enable that person to get started and ultimately deliver that product to the client. Um, so there's a little bit of a uniqueness and a lot of pressure on staffing firms, in my opinion, to make that onboarding process smooth and easy and consistent so that people can go to work on time. Right. Yeah. And I would say um, speed uh, and timeliness of getting onboarding done is kind of huge in this, in this area, in this industry, because, you know, time kills all deals. We know, we all know that. And time you kills know, all deals. Yes. <laughs> that's what we're looking for is trying to get people onboarded as quick as they can, because the client really has that dilemma of like, we have this urgent, position to be filled and how quick can we get it done? And onboarding is important. I mean, there are laws that we have to follow, make sure that everything is done correctly before we can really, you know, allow them to send that worker to start working. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Um, absolutely agree. Time kills all deals. And um, if you can't deliver your people, then you can't make any money. So um, onboarding is definitely unique in the staffing space for those reasons, but what are some of just the main onboarding requirements that people are going to have to think about if they're building their back office for the first time? Like what are some of the main, uh, onboarding requirements they'll have to uh, get in place to get people to start working? Yeah, I'd say like the primary number one, um, thing is always the I-9. We have to, you know, ensure that the worker is legally allowed to work in the United States. So, you know, going through that form I-9 process uh, is really important. Um, the W-4 is another very important one for, for, for your payroll taxes, um, collecting all the employees' personal information so that we can employ them, things like their social security number, their home address, um, date of birth, that, that kind of information. Um, 
And also, you know, making sure we get their payroll information, you know, so that we can make sure we're get, they're getting them paid timely and to the place that they want it if they want a live check or, um, you know, seems to be the most preferred option is direct deposit. So that can all be done uh, as well through our systems. There are a lot of other things in onboarding, but I'd say those are like the top four primary things that need to get done fairly quickly before anything can, you know, kind of continue. Um, yeah. And the I-9 being the most important one, why is that one so important besides the fact that it makes sure that somebody can legally start working? What are the implications of not having a properly filled out I-9? So the, the I-9 form, you know, like we said, it it shows that you're eligible to work in the United States. It has to be done. The employee has to have their part signed and completed by their first day of work. It can't go beyond their first day of work. Um, for the authorized representative section of the I-9, that can be completed within their first 72 hours of work. But you know the initial part where the employee fills out their part has to be done by their first day. So that's one of those things where it's super important that the sooner we get the information that the deal needs to start getting set up, it gives us more time to, you know, have that connection with the worker and get them rolling on the process before their start day. Um, and, you know, we don't want to push that time back if at all possible. So the other part is like making sure, you know, that the communication with the worker, you know, say between the recruiter and the worker that they know it's very urgent, they get started on their onboarding. It, it's all tied to how fast they go through and get started on everything. Um, you know, they they have to take action there. Um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's say you don't have an I-9 filled out on time, but that person starts working. What would you be exposed to as a staff? Uh, well, I mean, there are, you know, potentially audits from the, um, from ICE, from the DOL, um, you know, where, you, you know, the, there's a fine for every error and mistake on an I-9, and that's not a correctable mistake. If you're allowing someone to start before the day they've signed their I-9, that's not a mistake that can be corrected. So you can go through, like we do periodic audits of our I-9s. And there are mistakes that, you know, we can find later and say, oh, that was an error. We can go back and change it, get the signature back from the worker and say, like, here's what, you know, the mistake was, you know, it was audited properly internally. And we shouldn't get, you know, a fine if we're audited by um, the DOL. However, like I said, that issue of not having um, the start date and, you know, the um, signature date on the I-9 of the worker is not correctable. So it's a guaranteed fine if you get audited. Um, it's super important if you're starting a staffing firm and building your back office to take the I-9 process seriously, because there's going to be a lot of pressure from clients to get people to work. And if right. you don't hold the line and say, hey, like we need these pieces of information beforehand, it could actually be more trouble than it's worth. Meaning, just because you got them started doesn't mean that you're going to be profitable on that placement because you might get fined after the fact and put yourself in jeopardy. Right. Yeah. And and I know, I think, Nate, you've participated on some of the I-9 processes and getting them into, uh, you know, signed and, and finished and all that type of stuff. Would you describe that process as easy or difficult? Gosh, uh, because we're not in front of the person who's finishing the I-9, it makes it extremely difficult, you know, especially when they're not near a phone or checking their email every day, you know, you're trying to get a hold of this person. And uh, sometimes getting back the I-9 can take a couple of days. Sometimes, you know, they're, they're very prompt about it, but they miss, every, you know, everything, everything's wrong on their I-9. So going back and forth and trying to correct their I-9 with them remotely is, is a challenge. So. Yeah. yeah. And it's a complicated form too. I mean, they don't make it easy. <laughs> so it's no, like, if you're forms are never easy. <laughs> and if you, um, you know, like, you don't change jobs a lot. So a lot of times the worker is just not as familiar with the I-9 form as like, say we are, we see them every day, all day. But um, yeah, so they, it's, it can be confusing. So there are some, a lot of challenges with it. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. And um, staffing's changed recently, right? Like when staffing first began, there was brick and mortar stores. Everybody had their facility. You had the workers come into your brick and mortar location, which still happens, you know, but a lot of the onboarding and document signing and everything like that happens remotely now, especially in industries where travel is involved or you're placing non, uh, you're placing workers that work remotely, right? So like IT workers or people that work in offices, 
getting that information done remotely can be a challenge, just like you said, Nate. So that change to remote work or more travel work is um, is putting more pressure on this process. So I-9 is definitely a big one to think about. What are the other documents um, that are that are really, really important? Um, things that come to mind to me would be like just that personal information, mm -hmm. right? Can you talk a little bit about the personal information and why it's important to gather that in a safe manner? Um, because it is a lot of like very sensitive information. Yeah, I, Nate, do you want to take that or? Uh, if if you have uh, if you have any ideas, go for it. I mean, I can. Yeah, I guess I'm just saying, like, right, like you we're gathering name, social security number, date of birth, address, right? So that would all be considered PII, would it not? Yeah. So are, are you asking about the documents? Personal identified or... identifiable information, right? So I guess I'm just asking, it makes it complex, right? Think about all the staffing firms that exist in the country. How many of those are gathering that via email, right? How secure is email? I'm sure a lot. <laughs> so yeah, exactly. By nature is not secure, yeah. So that's really important. Like we, we you know, really want to work only in secure formats, like, using our portals, you know, that's secure. Um, other things that, you know, are, that seem maybe not as secure as email. Some people are confused by that, but like even fax is considered more secure than an email. So yeah, that's one thing that we're very careful of when we, you know, try to steer everyone away from putting anything that's um, PII in an email format. Um, I would assume that the majority of onboarding processes in America via in the small to mid-sized staffing agency market are done via email, mm -hmm. unless they're leveraging a technology like Foxhire or another EOR or um, another a software platform that enables them to do it in a yeah. secure platform setting. And the reason why, for those listening, right, if you're doing onboarding via email, or if you're um, thinking about doing it that way, you're exposing your workers to the theft of their data. Because if your email gets hacked, it gets your account gets hacked, that data is now in the hands of whoever hacked it, right? So that's extremely important to understand. Email is very hackable because of phishing scams and all the different people focusing on email from a bad actor perspective. So I brought up the personal information because that's part of gathering the data and it seems super simple and straightforward. And you might even receive data via email that you don't even want, right? Workers might just send you their driver's license in their email. Right. Like you want to steer away from that as much as possible. So, so for those that are listening, think about building a back office, really work towards not gathering onboarding data via email and gathering it some other way that's more secure, right? Like a software platform or an EOR platform that does it properly. So just some things to think about as you go into, um, you know, onboarding your first candidate as an example, or trying to improve your processes Email is bad. We don't like email from our onboarding perspective, right? Yeah. Um, what are some of the other things people have to think about, right? I, I think about things like um, drug screens and background checks. Those are usually pretty hefty um, processes to accomplish for a lot of the people being onboarded. Yep. Um, how might somebody go about getting those types of services? Just from the from the very beginning, if I wanted to onboard my first worker and I need and my client needs them to have a, a background check and a drug screen, where might I look to accomplish that? Yeah, there are lots and lots of background screening providers that you can, you know, use them um, in your business. Uh, I would, you know, depending on what your business is, like if you are, you know, say only staffing in one location in one state or, you know, something like that, that's one thing. But if you're potentially staffing in multiple states, multiple locations, it's, highly recommended to use a national provider that can handle all of those different states. There are different laws um, state by state on, you know, what kind of information can be revealed in a background screening and, you know, like say how long of a time frame you're allowed to see. Um, and then, you know, how adverse action would have to happen throughout that period. Um, if you were going to make a decision on something, you know, negative that was in the background check. So, you know, there are a lot of rules um, state by state. So, you know, it would be helpful to make sure you're using a background check company that can accommodate what your needs are in your business. Um, 
the other thing too, like we find with backgrounds and, you know, like there's typically like a standard background check that, you know, most employers are going to use like X, Y, Z. These are the screenings that we do for every worker that comes into our business. Um, but in staffing, it's different because, you know, there might be, um, you know, clients that you have that have a more strict um, background check requirement or drug screen requirement or, you know, uh, industries too. Like there are industry specific um, screening requirements sometimes too. So like if you're sending people into schools, it's different than when you're sending someone to work in a factory as for an example. So yeah. you, you just want to make sure you know what the ins and outs are for the industry or for that specific client. Um, you know, you can't really just put it all into one box. Yeah. That's, yeah. I'd say even, even, even more with the background checks with some of the licensing as well, you know, we have to double check some like nurse licenses or LPN licenses and, mm -hmm. and make sure that they're all compliant you know, as part of the background check. Yeah, yeah how, that's a good point. So how does, a uh, good question, how does licensing or credentialing, which is what you're talking about, Nate, differ from just background checks? Like there's more there. Like what, what are some of the things that you handle via credentialing that might be different from uh, just background check? Well, I, I guess background check would reflect on their person, whereas their license would reflect on their occupation. But either way, they're both still checks that need to happen, you know, yeah. pertaining to their role that you're assigning them to. Yeah. And I think that that's an important thing to differentiate as far as the language, right? Like onboarding encompasses all of the things we're talking about, including credentialing. Credentialing is specific to, in most cases, like healthcare uh, environments um, or environments that require a certain type of credentials, right? And so that would encompass things like uh, license verification. So if you have an RN license as an example, um, immunizations, making sure you're up to date on all of your immunizations uh, for your particular work site that they require. Um, things like that, which um, also might even encompass some type of like testing. So there's types of tests that you might have to pass in order to start working. One example is like a bloodborne pathogen exam. You know, nurses are required to pass those. Uh, sexual harassment training is another uh, test that you'd have to pass in certain states. So there's a yeah. lot more there than just run a background check, especially if you're in like a highly regulated industry, i.e. healthcare education. Right. So state specific requirements too, right? So we're, we're talking about sort of industry specific requirements. What about state specific requirements? Are there any like states that stand out as having more stringent or more requirements than other states? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, California is always like at the top of the list as far as like, you know, a multitude of differences in how uh, employment is done. There are a lot of notices that need to go to the employees. So that's another thing that's included in our onboarding. Um, you know, so you'll want to make sure that you have, you know, this the specific specific um, you know, federal, state, and local posters that, you know, coordinate with that area where that worker is working, um, so that they have the notices of, you know, things like what's the family medical leave law there? What are the meal and rest break laws there? What is the OSHA law there? You know, that sort of thing is in all of the labor law posters. Um, workers comp posters are state specific. Um, sexual harassment training, like you mentioned, that's another one that's very specific state by state. Some states don't have any kind of mandate, but there are a lot of states that do have a mandate and they're different with every state. Some of them might have additional manager training that's required. So if the role is a management role, you have to make sure they are getting the additional training that corresponds with whatever the state requirements are. Um, so yeah, it's, you know, if you're doing multi-state employment, it's very detailed. Right. And so differentiating that, having a process for that, all of those things can slow down or speed up onboarding, right? If you're looking at state specific requirements for the first time when you have a placement ready to go, probably not the best thing. So having that prepared up front and knowing exactly where you're placing and what you need to make sure those employees do, super important. Very easy to have things slip through the cracks and expose yourself to risk if you're not onboarding properly. Um, you know, one of the ways to do that is to digitize onboarding, right? So yeah. Uh, email onboarding is not digitized onboarding, right? Like printing and scanning, probably not the best thing. So, um, you know, outside of leveraging Foxhire, which is obviously, you know, we've digitized a lot of the onboarding processes. Are there any ways that you can digitize onboarding uh, if you're maybe wanting to build your own back office? 
that you can think of? I mean, not without service. Yeah. Like you said, that's, I mean, otherwise you'd have to develop it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think there's that, right? There, but there's also there's there's software platforms. So like let's say you wanted yeah. to build in the back office. There are some software platforms that exist that could help you do that if you wanted to. Um, you know, there's parts of ATS systems that could enable that, such as uh Bullhorn One, uh Aviante Bold. Those are systems that have some of the back office components that might incorporate onboarding. Um, another easier method is to just create fillable PDFs, right? So you have a fillable PDF that's sent, uh, makes it a little bit more digitize than just print and scan, print, sign, scan, right? All that type of stuff. Um, so those might be easier, uh, lower hanging fruit things to get out of the way. Um, but what about digitizing the I-9? Is that even possible? And if so, should they even try? Well, I, I think to your point earlier, where we're compromising a lot of their PII by sending stuff via email, Right. You know, you do need a secure platform to be able to send a lot of these, you know, fillable PDFs through, uh, you know, so if you're okay to, to risk it, you know, send it by email, then, you know, hey, more power to you. But, uh, you know, there's plenty of services out there right. um, at the expense of, of your costs, right? You're, you're um, you know, if you're trying to build a business around this, you're going to be spending a lot on it on outside services you might as well just maybe buy it or not buy hire a developer yeah but uh yeah it'd be a little tough <laughs> yeah absolutely what about the i9 though can you even digitize that that's one of the ones that we talk about and here in the industry that's like no one does it digitally it's almost impossible mm -hmm. there are services that that offer that now i think it's been you know a result of COVID, you know, it's kind of grown um, as, you know, people were working remotely and there was like a period of time where it was okay to um, do remote verification and things like that. So over time, those kind of services have developed, but, um, you know, yes, they, that is an option. And, you know, that's something that we've developed over the last few years internally too, within our software. And it's, I think it's really been huge in helping um, speed up our process and also keep, you know, just streamlining it. Um, it's been really great. So yes, it is, it is possible. It's an option. Um, yeah. There's a lot of detail involved in it, but yeah, it's, it's really good. The reason why it's difficult to digitize it is because it requires two people to participate, to get it signed, right? You need the actual employee who's signing on their behalf and then you need a witness. And historically, when you had a staffing firm, you had a brick and mortar location, as we talked about earlier, and that person would come into the office, the staffing firm employee would witness their information, and therefore they would then be able to sign it um, with remote work and the, everything happening digitally now. It's difficult to ensure on a specific day and time, you're going to have somebody that's able to witness, right? And so then also passing the buck or the responsibility of filling out the, the, the document digitally once somebody's filled out the information on the employee side, passing that to the witness to then sign is also difficult to do. So that's why digitizing it is very hard. And, and you know, starting with somebody doing it in person is obviously the easiest way, but if you're working in a remote environment, that's almost impossible. So um, very important to think through that, how you're going to make that happen uh, on a consistent basis. Um, but a lot of the other things that you're trying to work through can be digitized relatively simply because a lot of the services that exist out there for onboarding do enable um, the digital completion of a lot of these things um, outside of things you have to do physically, like get drug screened or something like that. You have to go to a location, but even the logistics around uh, getting to the drug screen, uh, there's now apps and they'll give you a, a QR code and you go there, it, you know, they make it as simple as possible, but um, digitizing it is very, very important to making it scalable. And I think that's important for somebody to think about if they're building their back office for the first time. Um, Jessica, what is, what is that one service we use to, um, that where we share witnesses across the country? I, I don't know if it's a service we're in or mm -hmm. a club or something. Yeah. It's a, they call it a consortium. So, you know, if we had to, um, if we had to have a physical in-person witness, or if, you know, someone on the other end of the consortium needed to use us to witness, you know, we're involved in that and connect that way. 
Yep. Yeah, that's through Coupa HR, which is the uh, college and universities HR professionals group. Um, they have a consortium, so all the different college campuses serve as physical locations to go get your I-9 witnessed if you're onboarding remote employees. Pretty cool. We participate in that, uh, and uh, we're not a college, but we are able to participate in it, and it enables us to um, be a little bit more secure and uh, have more um, flexibility when getting I-9s. So it is pretty cool. Um, I think that would be valuable uh, for uh, people to look into if there's other consortiums to join if you're not a college or university or don't support that space. Um, and all this is sort of leading up to, right, like the supply chain, right? Onboarding and staffing is the supply chain to start dates. That's the main component that we're talking about here. And what we haven't yet talked about is the importance of visibility across that supply chain. Like how important it is to show your client and for you to know where your employee is on that path and having it digitized enables you to do that. Right. Outside of that, it's very hard to show visually to your client and prove that you know somebody's making progress, you know, outside of emailing or calling, right? And and having a visual or digital representation of like the progress, I think is extremely important for clients to see and for them to trust you and for you to deliver a really good experience as a staffing firm. Mm -hmm. Um, we've worked on that on our side uh, for quite a long time now. And the improvements there, I think, have really made a difference for a lot of our partners. We're we're seeing a lot of our partners have uh, less questions and being able to visualize that. But if you can't deliver that, I think you create a lot of challenges for yourself. Then you probably get a lot of phone calls and emails asking you, is Bobby Sue able to start? Like that's, I mean, how many times have you gotten that question, Jess, over your career? Uh, many, many, many times. Um, I, I think that having, you know, that dashboard where we can drive, you know, the, recruiters and clients to evaluate what's happening in the dashboard is huge in onboarding. So it definitely takes a lot of the weight off of our onboarding specialists to not have to continue to hear those phone calls and, and then dig deep and figure out, okay, where things are at. And yeah, so it just automates that in such a huge way. So yeah, we love that. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Yeah, digital digital um, visibility and onboarding is like super helpful. So if you can get a service that does that or use an EOR that has that, super helpful. Um, and I think that's it. That that sort of summarizes the the onboarding uh, process uh, and things we think you should know about if you're looking to build a back office uh, from an onboarding perspective. So we hope you found that valuable and uh, definitely check us out on the next episode. We'll see you later. Thank you. Thanks.